Today on Locked On Red Wings, Detroit signs Emmett Finney to an entry-level contract. Who is he? And where in the world is Daniel Sprong? Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 200 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Scotty. Happy, happy, happy opening day to you as the Tigers finally I got, kick off. What, what, what's the, what's the baseball version of kickoff or tip off? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I'm not really sure there is one. I think Drop it's just. It. I mean, like, but opening day is like a unique baseball term, right? I mean, that's you know, other sports don't really have the opening day brand that. Uh, that baseball does. So yeah, I'm I'm super excited. It'll be a really really fun year, and yeah, I'm I'm pretty pumped just for you know my 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 life just completely goes out the window till October. It's gonna be gonna be a grind as it always is, but I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, swing off. Nope. No. no Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got we got some stuff to talk to you guys today about. Uh, one, we didn't talk about it yesterday because we had a game recap, but the Detroit Red Wings signed uh, their seventh round pick from 2023 to an entry level contract. That's Emmett Finney. We're going to talk about a little bit of who he is because I think he's flown a l- way under the radar. One is it being a seventh round pick, and then two, just the performance that he's had this year. We'll talk about him and what kind of player you can expect as he's going to finish out the year with the Grand Rapids Griffins. And then also talk about Daniel Sprong. He's been scratched the last three games. Last game he played was Columbus, so that means he's missed Nashville Islanders and Capitals, right? Those are the three that came after. So, yes, three games. We'll talk about, you know, why did is he's being scratched. And then, of course, we'll finish it off with a preview of the Carolina Hurricanes. So, with that being said, let's go go back to that first bullet point on the show sheet. Emmett Finney, who he is and uh, what he does, what he excels in. Uh, he's 18 years old. He's a six foot one forward who shoots left. He's played this year with the Cam Loops Blazers of the WHL, part of the Canadian Hockey League's uh, Cam Loops Blazers. Finished last place in the Western Conference in the WHL, and they only had 20 wins and 42 with 42 losses on the season. But Emmett Finney did lead their team in scoring this season as well. He finished the year with 59 points, 62 in 62 games, 19 goals, 40 assists, where uh, he also wore the A for assistant, alternate captain, whatever people, associate captain, whatever people want to call the A. It's always been up for dispute what it is. But Emmett Finney on a bad team had a really nice year with the Kamloops Blazers earned himself an entry-level contract. He's going to finish this season out on an amateur tryout with the Grand Rapids Griffins before heading up, uh, starting his entry-level contract this year, coming up. It's a three-year entry-level contract that's going to pay him. Let's see here. I have that up as well. $845 million, not million, $845,000. Wow. He is really good, folks. <laughs> we really are making good. sure that he is locked up long-term. That's if he's in the NHL. He has a minor league salary of, 825, $82,500. So Scotty, first things first, when you saw the signing of Emmett Finney, you know, what was your reaction? Well, it was, it was surprise. Uh, He's obviously not someone that is as much in the main loop, uh, the, the main source of conversation when fans and media talk about Red Wings prospects. He's not somebody that usually comes up, but as you pointed out, has had a really, really respectable season is obviously still what 18, like, you know, very, very young, very talented and and has put together a really solid season. So that's somebody that I was like, wow, I didn't really uh, necessarily expect to get this notification today. But the second that we started talking about it and and looking at it, it kind of makes sense at the same time. Yeah. He's um, according to his elite prospects page on, well, elite prospects, 
They, they describe him as a high motor player, always is willing to lay the body into people. He plays both ends of the ice and he's got a, some skill as well because, and so when you're looking at a guy like him to add him to the Grand Rapids roster, especially as they go for a playoff push where they have lost a little bit of their physicality with Simon Edmondson, different positions, but still you need some of that physicality. It's good to add that back as well as just give a, get a, get a look at a guy who maybe surprised some people. We talked about it last year. Amadeus Lombardi last year had an electric year uh, with the Flint Firebirds and then signed a contract as what a sixth round pick that same season, yeah. Elmer Soderblom the year before sixth round pick like every single one of these years, one of these late round picks who we don't follow, we followed Amadeus Lombardi very closely because he played so close to home for us. But a lot, some one of these prospects we don't follow very closely signs an entry level contract. And those are always the guys you root for the most because you're like, you always want that diamond and rough player to work out. I mean, Henrik Zetterberg is a prime example. Uh, Pavel Datsuk is another one, right? Yeah. Diamond in the roughs. You want to find that next Datsuk. You want to find the next Zetterberg. Not putting any pressure on Emmett Finney here to be no, the obviously. next, but it always catches your eyes. And my, my first reaction when I saw the signing of Emmett Finney at first was like, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that name. I was well, like, he was a draft pick, but when was he taken? And then I was shocked to see who was a draft pick this year because, and this is just part of how my brain works. Like, after rounds four, after round four, my brain kind of is like five, six, seven. Then you can start to get into like nepotism territory. You're starting to take sons of former players in the draft yeah. just because you, this, that, and the other. So whenever you see one of these guys pop up and like they take that next step and he's going to be playing professional hockey next year, you're like, all right, Emmett, let's go. Let's see what you can be made. Like, you know, Amadeus Lombardi, it's obviously been a tough adjustment for him to the AHL level. He's not scoring 100 plus points in his first year with the Grand Rapids Griffins, especially given his size. But the adjustments happening, he's starting to play a little bit better. So hopefully, Emmett Finney, who has more size, different skill set, you know, can find himself next season and and the season after that with a nice adjustment. And then, you know, who knows? We all have those stories, and hopefully, he can find his way to the Red Wings roster. Yeah, well, One that's day. the sure for sure that that's the thing that already kind of makes this a success story right? Like, this guy was a, a seventh round pick and we had multiple picks in several rounds. I think he was, he would have been like the 10th or 11th, I think actually 11th player taken in our draft, right? Like he was the 11th, 10th or 11th selection in the Red Wings actual draft uh, because of the, the doubling up in, in, especially at the top last year. So for a guy to be that late of a pick and be that kind of down on the draft board to get that opportunity with Grand Rapids, get the entry-level deal, et cetera, is, is already a win, right? So many of the the sixth and seventh round picks, as you mentioned, are uh, kind of like either nostalgia plays or just guys that you have never heard of, we've never heard of, and are probably not going to be impact players at the highest level. And so for him to to already have instilled enough confidence to – you know, get this far and not just be in and out of the organization in, you know, a calendar year or two is is unbelievably impressive. So, yeah, th those kind of stories are really easy to root for. for sure. Well, you're and you're right. It is already for where he was taken. It's already sort of a six success story to take the step to professional hockey is a success yeah. story for a guy. Even if he just ends up being organizational depth, having right. an AHL caliber player that that plays, uh, you know, forward, especially a deep position. Um, out of the seventh round is is already a dub. And I'm not trying to limit what he can become either. Obviously, I, I hope he, he's still so young. I hope he keeps working and, and can be in the NHL someday. But um, it's just one of those things you look at it today and you go, yeah, this is kind of already a, a, a heck of a pick, even you know, no matter what happens from here on out. Well, and he's also that, that type of player that we love so much on the podcast, right? He's a yeah. guy who consistently influences the play even without the puck. This is from the Elite Prospects uh, draft guide from last year. Nonstop engine powers him up and down the rink, making space to poke away pucks on the back check and force turnovers on the four check. He enters every battle with a couple of shoulder checks to find options and has the skill to connect. I mean, that's like oh, similar, like I don't want to compare one to one, but when talking about prospects, like Carter Mazur is a similar guy, high motor guy. He's got some skill, but a high motor guy who will grind it out for the puck battles and won't give up on plays. Like that's what we love about Carter Mazur when we uh, watch him play in prospects tournaments and everything we hear about his tenure in the AHL. Like that's the kind of stuff that we personally really like. So yeah, I mean, good for Emmett Finney. Hopefully he can go all the way, make it to the NHL, but nonetheless, a seventh round pick, get an entry level contract in the NHL and, and going to the AHL is, is still a massive success story.
Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to talk about Daniel Sprong and uh, why has he been scratched for the last three games? So stay tuned to segment two of Lockdown Red Wings. Got to talk to you guys today about FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use up on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until, until they cut down the nets. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings podcast. We're going to move on now to talking about Daniel Sprong, uh, who has been scratched the last three games, and try and understand why he has been scratched, right? Because you look at the roster. He's played 68 games of the 72 that have been played. He's got 40 points on the year, which is seventh on the Red Wings in total points, tied with JT Comfer. And Patrick Kane, first of all, Patrick Kane having 40 points in 41 games. That story never gets old. But, I mean, this is a depth signing that you signed to be depth scoring that has done just that. I mean, prior, I don't know what his pace is now, but prior to the three games in a row where he was scratched, he was on pace to at least tie or tie or slightly surpass his career high in points, which was set last year at 46. So this is a guy who you signed to be depth scoring, is depth scoring, but you called up Berggren and Zarnik, and all of a sudden Sprong found himself on the outside looking in. And so the question is, is why is that the case? Yeah, I think that this is a, I don't know if play style is too direct, but I think that this is an emphasis on defense throughout the team. And I think that it's also why Berger was on the outside looking in. I think that those are similar conversations to be had uh, guys that obviously can provide depth scoring down, especially in the bottom six in the lineup card, but uh, neither are going to give you plus defense. We'll say on that side of the puck. And I think that that is, is like I said, where that conversation kind of starts and ends with both of those guys. You can lump Berger into that conversation as well. And I also think that that's probably why, Somebody like Zarnik has gotten more opportunities. Not that he's necessarily, you know, clamps down there, but uh, I, I think he's probably more sound than uh, some of the other guys who have played fourth line at points this year. Yeah, and I think a big part of the reason, too, is the month of March has been especially unkind to him. Uh, like many other players, it's not just him, but during the losing streak, in the month of March, he has had one point, and that's just on the one goal he scored against the yeah. Buffalo Sabres, which is a really important goal in that game. But when we're talking about and your, your point of play style is a big thing, right? You have a lot of players on this roster who are all offense and zero defense. And the fourth line, you couldn't, we've talked about it, odd man out on the fourth line. You couldn't have both Robbie Fabry and Daniel Sprong as your wingers on the fourth line because they're too similar of players. They're offense first, no defense. And then so you have a center like Joe Valeno, who we love Joe Valeno, but with the call up of Austin Zarnick, now you have a defensively responsible two-way center playing that role, move Joe Valeno to the wing with Robbie Faber. You balance that fourth line out, and I, I've really liked what I've seen out of Austin Zarnick so far. We said it on yesterday's episode. Um, they looked great in the almost nine minutes of ice time they had. Again, small sample size, and they're playing against the lightest competition, but I thought they looked really good in that role, and in fact, the advanced numbers support it. They were 27% relative in their 9% compared to their teammates as a line, which is incredible. Um, but it's just one of those situations where Bergen came up and they wanted to see what they had in him. And then Bergen didn't work out, but they realized they still needed to fix the defense in some way. So they called up Zarnuck to give him a little bit more defensive support. The thing I don't understand is why you choose Sprong over Fabry as the player that sits out. And I think because I compared them just now kind of directly, it, but even though they play similar, they're not the same kind of player, right? Robbie Fabry, and I guess to answer my own question, you know, Robbie Fabry is a little bit higher motor. He does try a little bit harder. He's not great defensively still, but he does try a little bit harder. I think he's a little bit more creative with the puck. Well, where Daniel Sprong is a, I go to spot and I shoot kind of guy. Now he's great at that. Again, 40 points on the season. That's nothing to sneeze at. The bulk of those coming, of course, in the power play. So it just comes to a thing where you got to make a decision. But 
now that you've played three games without him and you've only won one of those games and one of those games he sat out was a one nothing shutout, you do wonder too, like, okay, do you try and get him back in the lineup? Do you scratch Robbie Fabry instead? I would love to see Sprung in the mix more. And he's someone that at times throughout the year, depending on situation, can also provide you something on, you know, like second unit power play and whatnot. I mean, he he obviously brings value and is having a really productive season given his role. Um, I would be totally fine with swapping him and Fabry. I, I, I think that that is something that can provide more value down on those bottom six, uh, in that bottom six unit. But um, yeah, like I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I don't, I'm not sure that that decision one way or another is, is going to make or break something or be like this big revelation and, and be the reason for, you know, like a hot streak or something, obviously. And I'm not saying you're saying that, but um, I, I, I do. Yeah. I would like to see Sprong play more. Certainly. I, I don't want him to be the, the 13th forward the rest of the season. I would like to see him in the mix a little bit more. Uh, but I, I also don't have, you know, like serious qualms when he is the healthy. I, I, I understand it. Well, and because then we talk about Robbie Fabry, right? And he's had four points the month of March, but he only has 29 points all season long. Like Sprong, as much as I just praised Fabry for being a little bit more dynamic as a four, just slightly, you know, Sprong's been the more productive forward at that. So you look at the player usage charts, sure. and I love Robbie Fabry for what it's worth. And I love Sprong too, but it's just a situation where you have to make a decision. And, you know, you've lost two really close games where Sprong's goal scoring ability may have been the difference maker. I'm not saying Sprong For saves sure. the season single-handedly, well, but it could have helped. Yeah, and, and when you look specifically at the last two games, right, you have a, a shutout and then another, you know, game that went into overtime. Those are really easy to point to and be like, man, if we had a guy that you could, <laughs> that that was a little bit more reliable in putting the puck in the back of the net or at least getting opportunities on net in either of those games, obviously really easy to point to any shutout. Uh, and, and make that claim. Uh, I think that's certainly fair. Yeah, and you can see here, right? Like when we talk about the defense, like when Sprong's in the lineup, they can't utilize that fourth line in any way, shape, or form that's a, a defensive metric. Like, yes, he does have 48% of his zone time start in the offensive zone. So 52% starts as defensive zone deployment. That's mainly because the team just struggles to possess the puck and get face off, uh, offensive zone face-offs to begin with. But you look at the quality of competition. I mean, he has the second easiest deployments against other teams' t players out of anyone on the roster besides Austin Zarnick, who's played just a few games with the Detroit Red Wings. And in that time, he's negative relative. But then the counter argument to that is look at Robbie Fabry. Fabry, yes, does get a couple more percentage points in terms of defensive zone deployments, but he is he is far worse off relative the darker the red the circle for you those of you who are watch, not aren't watching on youtube the darker red the circle the worse relative that player is to their teammates in shot attempt share daniel sprong is like bay she's just barely negative relative at shot attempt share fabry's far worse off than that despite the fact that he only gets he gets slightly slightly easier competition it's really it's you're splitting hairs with a lot of this but the one place you can't split hairs at is the actual production numbers where Sprong has 11 more points and uh, the, you know, the, the shot attempt share, just like the actual Corsi four percentage when that player is on the ice, Sprong is much better relative to his teammates than Robbie Fabry is. So while I understood, I can understand like you need one of those two guys to sit out. It's probably not even, this is my speculation, right? It's probably not between those two guys. I'm sure in the locker room, it's something else, but me just looking at the roster, trying to make sense of it. I see it as like a, a race between those two guys at this point. I mean, throw Sprong back in there and see if that it adds juice, especially with having been sat for three straight games, maybe. And that's what happened, right? Like he got sat before the game against the Buffalo Sabres. He came back and he scored a goal and a big game for the Red Wings. So like maybe he comes back and he's even better. It's it's just one of those situations where Zarnik and Valeno are more dynamic players on the fourth line. And the fourth line has been playing better because of that. But like at the same time, you need, you need that depth offense. Like if they're just going out there and the achievement of that shift is just not giving up a goal as opposed to, you know, not being scored on or scoring a goal. It's like, is that really that much better? For if sure. That makes no. sense. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you again. I, I would love to see him back out there. I think that <laughs> it, 
especially given uh, the situation the Wings are in the last 10 games. I think uh, a, a shooter who is going to at least give you some more opportunities is probably not a bad thing to have down there. Also, just as a whole, I mean, you look at this graph here on Dauber Frozen Tools and, look and you graph. look at the how your entirety of your top nine minus Joe, uh, Christian Fisher are getting yeah. tough competition. Like they shelter so hard that the bottom line in particular to begin with, and they still can't produce, you know, Corsi relative positive. And the fact that there's only four players on this entire team who are positive um, when it comes to shot attempt share versus their teammates is crazy. Like Raymond Larkin, Debrinket, and Kane are all solid blue. They're all positive, super positive uh, relative towards their teammates. And the rest of the forwards are just struggling. It's about right. I mean, there's a whole conversation. We've talked about the usage of the defensemen, but maybe there's a conversation to be, need to be had about the uh, usage of the forwards as well. Yeah, but. well, I, yeah, at this rate, that's going to be a off-season conversation. <laughs> so, yeah, we just wanted to have a conversation, right? Like, where is Daniel yeah. Sprong? I think he deserves an opportunity to slot back in the lineup, see if that can make a difference. I'm not saying it was wrong to scratch him, but at this point, having lost two tight games, Put him back in the lineup. Let's let's yeah, no, scratch I'm, somebody else. I agree. I, I think uh, I think he's a he's an easy candidate candidate to get back in there. I also thought your intro, I, I when you were like, "Where in the world is?" I was thinking Carmen San Diego. That was exactly brain. why I did it. That's good. It's good. That's a throwback, man. It's a throwback. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. That's yeah. why this is why we're uh, that's why we ball. <laughs> we'll be back with a new uh, back with a new episode. We'll be back in segment three like, wow, with a game preview. I wish we were. Uh, we'll be back with a game preview in segment three of the Carolina Hurricanes, the best five on five team in the league. So stay tuned for that. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, the Red Wings are playing the Carolina Hurricanes today by the time the people are listening to this. And they are second in the Metro Division by the numbers, are the best five-on-five -five team in the league by Corsi 4 percentage, by Fenwick, by their second in the league and expected goals 4 percentage. And the last time these two, these two teams played, we know it didn't go the Red Wings' way, and it went exactly the way we expected, where the Red Wings couldn't produce a lot of offense because they couldn't get the puck. So, Scotty, you're playing the Carolina Hurricanes. Where in the world is the Detroit Red Wings offense? <laughs> okay. All right. We need we need uh, we need to calm down. It's enough Carmen San Diego for the day. Um <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean that's that's going to be the well, I, there's a lot of questions. I was going to say that's going to be the big question, but th there's a lot, right? Like I mean, you, you the Red Wings obviously need to have a really sound defensive game for as much as we talk about the the Hurricane system as you just alluded to. This is a team that uh, is is very capable of scoring quite a lot of goals, and uh, I, I think that it's you're gonna have to play a really complete hockey game because that's what we say every time. Really, any team in the league plays the Carolina Hurricanes. That's gonna be what is required of you, and uh, it's it's easy to point to the offense and hope that we can put some goals up as well. This is one of the better defensive oriented teams out there, and has been for several seasons now. And yeah, they're they're fourth best in the league, just in fewest amount of goals given up a game, despite being 24th in save percentage. So that should give you kind of an idea of of how good their defense is and how good their shot suppression is with bottom 10, bottom eight in the NHL goaltending. They just from save percentage, 
Uh, they are still in the top five in the league and fewest amount of goals given up a game. Uh, then that is, again, just a, a huge testament to they also are top three in both special teams units. I, I mean, yeah, this is this is one of the best teams in the league for a reason. Uh, yeah, this, this is a team. And I feel like every time we preview them, we say the same thing, right? Like this is weirdly a year where for a team that always has gotten superb goaltending and partly because they're the goaltending has always been insulated very well by the defensive scheme around them. But this year, the the the, de- the goaltending hasn't been there for them as nearly as much as it has been in previous years. Now, their goaltending save percentage is up to 19th, where it was lower in the season, as Koch- Kochekov has gotten uh, hit his stride a little bit here. But this is there's no easy way to say it. And we've said it a few times before playing against some of these tough teams. But with a tough stretch and just two points out of a wild card, the Rings are going to have to play their best hockey every single night for the next. 10 games, 10 games if they want to make the playoffs. And it's tough to say do that when you have Carolina, Florida, and the Rangers as your next three hockey games, three of the best teams in the league. But that being said, you know, this is a hockey team that's done it in the past. If you can suppress Sebastian Ajo, who has 80 points on the season, you know, prevents uh, Seth Jarvis uh, from doing what he can do. Primarily, it's Sebastian Ajo. If you can you can suppress Sebastian Ajo, you'll you'll probably be able to stay in the game. He's got eighty <laughs> He's points in seventy bad. games. He's, He's got eighty bad. and seventy. Yeah, Jarvis is their second leading point getter with fifty seven and seventy three. But like, yeah, you're this is a you roster to roster scheme to scheme. You're outmatched. Like this is a team that just is plays like a complete hockey team. They don't have anyone on their roster. Of course, now they have Jet uh, Gensel, who has been really added to their. He's been over a point per game since they've acquired him. He's played nine games with the uh, Hurricanes and has 12 points in that span. He's been very good, and a lot of those are assists, 10 assists in that span. Over an assist a game, that's even better than over a point per game. Over an assist per game. Good job. I mean, geez, it's just... I don't know, man. I You're going to have to play the best game of your life for the next 10 games if you want to make it in the playoffs. And I don't want to, it's too late in the season to be tanking. So I don't want to hear any tanking conversations. You just got to go out there and you got to win. And we've been saying that last week and a half too, like just go and win. Please. Like there isn't, there isn't an Achilles heel to this team. You can point to and be like, this is where you got to take advantage. Like they're better than you in every aspect of the hockey game. Yeah. The the only thing you could do to like, if you wanted to, uh, I don't know, like, salt in a wound and and really kind of drive into a weakness would be if you were able to get a lot of shots on net and that's which you don't do right <laughs> which the wings don't do on a regular basis and that the panthers don't give up on a regular basis so that would be out of character for both of uh for both of those teams if that were to happen yep and we didn't get any update out of practice on wednesday so we have no indication of who would start in this hockey game although i imagine with I don't know, actually. This is really tough because I think Lyon's been the better goalie the last couple nights, but he has been rewarded with a win. But meanwhile, James Reimer has won the last three games he started. So maybe they go back to Reimer here. I think I see maybe. they could. I feel like they could. Uh, but I don't know. It's tough. I think Lyon's been the better goalie, but Reimer's the one who's been getting the wins. So it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough one. You got any final thoughts? I don't think so, man. We ball. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow, recapping the game against the Carolina Hurricanes, so stay tuned for that. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.